Well, I, I was around for the creation of the gold ETF. And do you know what the narrative was at the time? It was, you know, this capital is going to come into this space, but the day-to-day -day trading volumes of gold are actually not large enough to sustain that kind of capital inflow. You know what happened? The daily trading volumes of gold went through the roof. We did a research and we said, okay, we think we know the price elastic response to inflows to the price of Bitcoin. And so, you know, we modeled what we reasonably thought the inflows would be. So you multiply the inflows by the price elastic response and you end up with a price. And that price, I think, came out to between $115,000 and $140,000. This is just math. Now, what's the causality there? All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Danny here with me. Uh, Danny, last time we talked was about two years ago. A lot's happened since then. Uh, prices went up a lot, then they went down a lot, seem to be recovering. How do you evaluate maybe from the top of the 2021 bull market to today, what's happened and more importantly, why it's happened? Well, great to see you again, Paul. And um, yeah, it's been uh, two years since we last spoke and, and uh, it seems like an awfully long time, uh, but a lot has happened. So I guess we've probably been both occupied with the uh with the developments in the marketplace um like me you've been through multiple crypto cycles uh, believe it or not this is my uh 11th year in the crypto industry um and you know the industry has changed you know in a dramatic way over that period of time um as i first recall it was populated almost exclusively by computer scientists and startups called you know blockchain.com and coinbase uh, and we've come a long, long way since then. You know, I, I think at the at the coin shares level, you know, our, our approach, and, and I, we can get into the company, I think, a little bit later, but our approach was to build something very solid, very robust, something which would be fit for a public market, you know, at the top uh, end of the uh, listing spectrum. And accordingly, you know, we built our business quite slowly um, and carefully, and we have no choice. But... Some of our peers and competitors built their businesses extremely rapidly. And as you will well know, and our audience will well know, we saw a dramatic rise and fall uh, for companies like Bitmex, um, for companies like um, Celsius, Three Arrows. You know, I mean, the list is very, very, very long. And those companies were both, you know, very fortunate to grow as rapidly as, as they did. Um, but as we were going through that period of uh, extremely rapid growth of those companies, my impression certainly was they were running a little bit too fast. And I don't think the governance was there. I don't think the risk management was there. Uh, I heard some extraordinary stories about, you know, people extending credit that no one in their right mind would extend. All looks great in a bull market. But then, you know, you have uh, the inevitable unwinding. And um, I actually posted something on my LinkedIn uh, at the bottom of the market, pretty much as soon as SBF was was arrested. And that was, you know, the low in psychology. It was everybody was not just force liquidated that was liquidated. Then there was a sort of a delayed reaction where it wasn't you going bust, it was your counterparty going bust that made you go bust. And the sentiment just became maximum negative. And, you know, you, that was the low of the move, 16K or something like that basis Bitcoin. I have seen this multiple times, you know, in my career on Wall Street, where uh, there's been a cycle and it happened in oil, it happened in natural gas, it happened in copper. Um, and the similarities were incredible. There was always, you know, the big market leading company It would have been Kanamatsu in copper, it would have been Metal Gesellschaft in energy, it would have been Enron in natural gas, it would have been Brian Hunter in Amaranth in the natural gas hedge fund business. Very big dominant company, um, you know, read FTX for that and maybe a couple of others. There was a poster child spokesman for that company, with all the names that we we now know in, in, in infamy. And and when those people, you know, ran out of road and the market began to sense they were vulnerable and people all exited the ship uh, and they sank in every case and were arrested in many cases and jailed in some cases, that always represented the cycle low. And in each of those examples I just quoted, yeah, it represented the multi-year cycle low of the asset class. So, you know, going back to, you know, the S SBF uh, collapse, uh, we were talking 16K Bitcoin, that was the wrong price. 
Uh, given everything, it was the wrong price. There, it was a victory lap for the haters. There was forced liquidation left, right, and center. There was knock-on effects from third-party exposures that sunk other people. And um, it was the wrong price. So we had a, something of a recovery. Call it to the you know low 20s, mid 20s. And then some other interesting stuff happened where there were a series of enforcement actions, you know, largely by the SEC, but not limited to the SEC. And I think those in, in the initial phases had very negative impacts on price. So you'd see the latest lawsuit and the market would be down, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollars on the back of it. And as a market watcher myself, and again, having been through these cycles in other commodities, what you're really looking for is the time when those pieces of news no longer move the market. And the market then sort of becomes immune uh, and impervious to that kind of news. And you need to see that because in any investment, you really need to know, you know, where the bottom is. You know, it might be a silty bottom, but somewhere roughly where the bottom is. And when that kind of news can be absorbed without a market impact, uh, you know that there's a little bit of a foundation there. So, you know, now we're in the mid 20s and, you know, we we don't really have much of a catalyst. I think it was very instructive to look at a lot of private company stocks, not just ours, but many, many others, as interest rates, you know, got very high uh, to the five, six, seven percent, depending on which country you're talking about. The valuations and the multiples of all these private companies collapsed and, and you know, in many cases haven't significantly recovered. And I think, you know, Bitcoin is one of those kind of um, risk on assets, probably arguably the most risk on asset. And therefore, um, while we were sitting at 25, you know, having been too low at 19, we're sort of battling this headwind of, of really high interest rates and, and lack of speculative capital and liquidity, you know, shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, not just in the macro environment, but in the crypto environment as well. Um, and that was true of counterparties going out of business. It was true of credit lines that people were offering and could receive uh, and so on. And then all of a sudden, you know, following July, you know, July was kind of, you know, uh, crept up to near 30. Following that, you know, two things start to happen. You started to see a little bit of a chink initially in the energy price, which took some of the heat out of inflation because the, you know, Russia-Ukraine spike started to kind of wear off. Then you sort of saw a little bit of backing up in inflation as well. And all of a sudden, we're not sitting here thinking rates are going to God knows what number. Um, with thinking actually the worst might be over. That's good for another little bump. You still don't really have a catalyst at that point, okay? You, you're just kind of trying to avoid the bullets, as it were. And um, the catalyst was really, I think, um, you know, let's call it broadly institutional interest in crypto, something that we've been after for a long time. You know, you had a confluence of a number of events. We've got some forward process, forward progress in, in regulation in Europe through the market legislation, makes some sense. You know, Switzerland's still a very solid jurisdiction. The UK is a little bit sort of uh, negative generally with crypto, but trying to make steps to go forward. In fact, if you listen to the politicians, it sounds a lot better than it actually is when you talk to the regulator, but moving in the right direction. And so that started to look a little bit better. Rates start to look a little bit softer. And then we have some tangible input, you know, like the BlackRock ETF. And I think that was, you know, that was the catalyst to, to really move this. And what it's saying is, Okay, we've kind of exited all the bad actors. Uh, we've put at least the seeds of a regulatory framework in Europe in place and outside of America. Um, and that's a base on which you can build. And I think that is a legitimate catalyst. I think the impact of that kind of thing, um, people need to understand that when BlackRock has a product, BlackRock has three trillion of assets that they can deploy, their clients can make a 10 basis point allocation for Bitcoin, that's a huge number. And those clients probably wouldn't buy something outside of that environment because, you know, they deal with the biggest and the best clients in the world. So that, I, you know, that I think is where we are. And that, that I think now continues because, you know, another thing I've learned about markets over a long period of time is when there is an event horizon, and the event horizon in this case is the approval of such an ETF, um, the market tends to move into that vacuum while it's happening. That's why I'm not really in a hurry for a judgment. <laughs> I kind of like to see this drag on all, all, year, all next year would be just fine because I think the anticipation of that uh, is a positive. And um, 
And also, you know, we're seeing for the first time, I would say, um, you know, institutional interest in to be involved in the marketplace from really quality companies who may want us to white label products, may want to buy our products. For the first time, you know, we're, we're seeing, and it almost seems to me like, you know, these institutions are going, right, we had a big backup in price. We had a big clean out of, of bad actors. We've got some regulatory framework, which we can kind of hang our hat on. We've clearly got the client demand. Larry Fink will tell you that directly. And so we're going to try and get involved. And um, hey, this is this is what, you know, you and I have been sitting around waiting for for many years. And uh, I, I truly believe that is happening as we speak. How impactful, if we kind of look forward, maybe the next two to three, five years, how impactful can this be? And, and I'll give you kind of uh, a couple of things I've been thinking about. I don't yet have kind of a strong opinion about, right? One is if somebody wanted Bitcoin badly enough, they probably went and figured out a way to get it is one argument. Yep. Uh, a second one is even if the ETFs gathered 50 billion in assets, it's an yep. 850, 900 billion dollar asset. And so how much could you really, you know, it's not like it's going to triple overnight. Another argument is, no, this is the signal that everyone gets in, right? Every asset manager, nation states, kind of it, it is this time is different. And, and there's uh, the breakout of this kind of four-year cycle and, and kind of having process. Where, where do you sit and, and how are you thinking yeah. about this right now? Today's episode is brought to you by Trust and Will. I've gone through a number of different changes in my life over the last few years. I got married, I had a kid, and I had to start thinking about how could I ensure that my wife and my child would be okay if anything ever happened to me. That's where trust, wills, and estate planning come into play. Now, most people, what they do is they get introduced to a friend, an uncle, or someone in their local community. It tends to be someone who's really expensive, a lawyer, an accountant, or somebody who does estate planning, and they just simply are using a one-size-fits-all template and just telling you, pay me thousands of dollars, and I'll use the same thing for you as the guy down the street. But that's not what Trust & Will does. They have a trusted online estate planning product that starts as low as $159, which allows you to now protect your legacy from the comfort of your own home, leverage their excellent customer support, available via phone, email, or chat. They have thousands of five-star reviews and a rating of excellent on Trustpilot. It takes most people 20 to 30 minutes to complete their estate plan with Trust & Will. And not only that, but if you go to trustandwill.com slash pomp, you'll get 10% off. Plus, you'll get free shipping of all your estate planning documents. So go to trustandwill.com slash pomp and make sure you get an estate plan in place. Whether it's for you or one of your loved ones, having a trust and or a will can literally be the difference between someone being taken care of and someone not. Go check them out today at trustandwill.com slash pomp. Well, I was around for the creation of the gold ETF in the beginning and, and to date myself. Um, and you know what the narrative was at the time? It was, okay, you know, this capital is in theory going to come into this space, but the day-to-day -day trading volumes of gold are actually not large enough to sustain that kind of capital inflow. And you know what happened? The daily trading volumes of gold went through the roof. And, and, you know, when we at CoinShares, uh, and I'm not sure how publicly available this research is, you might have to call James Butterfield, our head of research, and ask him nicely uh, if any viewers are interested. It could be on our website. I'm not absolutely sure. We, we did a, you know, we, we lead the industry in terms of providing data on institutional inflows into crypto. And so we have some very granular data on that. And we, we did a research on our own, and we said, okay, we think we know the price elastic response to inflows to the price of Bitcoin. We can correlate that back over time. Um, half our marketing and research team, by the way, came from the gold business, funny enough, because we hired them from uh, Wisdom Tree, uh, actually, to come to the crypto industry. And so they're very familiar with that whole, um, that whole uh, development back in, in the gold ETF beginnings. And so, you know, we modeled what we reasonably thought the inflows would be. So you multiply the inflows by the price elastic response and you end up with a price. And that price, I think, came out to between $115,000 and $140,000. Now, I have never in my entire crypto career been the guy saying the moon and 500K and, you know, all that kind of rubbish. But this is just math, right? This is just like a reasonable assumption for these kind of inflows moves it that way. Now, what's the causality there? You can't just say that the creation of a gold ETF uh, and the inflow of institutional clients who wouldn't have otherwise invested in gold was the only factor, because once they start doing it, the retail starts doing it as well. 
So, so I do think that um, it will be, you know, maybe the type of people you mentioned in your first comment, those who figured out how to do it first, it's probably where we are right now. Second, you know, you get the actual announcement. There's maybe a little profit taking. Usually the rumor, buy the rumor, sell the fact thing is a, is a, is a good strategy to trade. Uh, and after that, you're sitting there waiting for inflows to come into the into, into the actual ETF, and and I think that will be a real driver. Um, happened also in the silver ETF, which came after the gold ETF. And Barclays, who used to own the silver ETF before they had the problems in 2008 and had to sell it to BlackRock, um, used to publish a very useful spreadsheet showing you how much silver had been accumulated into the ETF week by week by week. And after six months of this, you could draw a line through it and kind of go, there's not enough silver. And silver reacted, you know, accordingly. So, so yeah, I think it's real. And I think it starts with the, the guys that can already do it. It's followed by the institutions. And then it's followed by the retail guys who probably got a little bit burnt, you know, in a couple of the dips, um, particularly in 21. Um, but it's, it's a green light across the board, I think. Now, when we look at um, what is – Happening now, there's some people who are front running Federal Reserve potentially moving back towards loose monetary policy, cutting rates, you know, kind of the, the whole narrative that I think people are grabbing onto. How important is the Federal Reserve for the movement of Bitcoin's price? And um, on one hand, we see these like, you know, Bitcoin over global M2 supply. On the other hand, we see the Fed still committed to destroying investor demand and Bitcoin's up, you know, 150 uh, percent on the year. And it seems like, you know, could care less what Jerome Powell says in his press conferences. I think it makes a huge impact. Um, you know, it's just looser credit. You know, Bitcoin is a very responsive act, uh, uh, asset class um, to looser credit. Um, I'm surprised it didn't do a little bit better under the inflationary kind of regime. Um, but, you know, for all those who said, oh, it was disappointing that Bitcoin didn't rally more, you know, during the inflationary cycle, because Bitcoin had been touted as an inflationary asset, well, we didn't really know that because, because um, we'd never seen an inflationary cycle before in the history of Bitcoin. It was too uh, too young. So it, I think, you know, what we've learned, and we do keep learning as time goes by about how Bitcoin responds, um, to me, it is, a, it, is a, it is a risk on asset, you know, backed by some technology tailwind that, that slowly kind of permeates it out amongst, you know, many, many more users. As you can see from you know, wallet adoption and, and the amount of Bitcoin in wallets, it just diffuses out into space continually over time. Um, so, yeah, I do think that, the, that we're clearly on the shallow, you know, beginnings of a, a down cycle in rates. Um, and, you know, the, the Fed has not done a great job of reducing the size of the balance sheet to date, neither of any other central banks. Um, not quite sure how good they're ever going to be at doing that. And, you know, as cycles happen, maybe we'll do some more money printing at some point in time. So so I think there's, you know, a modest tale when all other things being equal. Um, and as, you know, as we see failure to reduce the balance sheets and, and arguably in some extraneous circumstance, more money printing, it seems to be unavoidable over time and politically unavoidable. Um, then, then you know, we start, we, we ratchet higher still. So, you know, look, this is not a crazy bull market like it's going to be up ten thousand dollars in a day as it has been you know from time to time in the past i think it's a really broad based or potentially broad based and very solid rally that could go on for some time now coin shares i think is very interesting business because you basically have exposure to different parts of the market right you know i've yeah. seen reports that say hey look at their principal investing they're fantastic investors there's others that say wow this asset management business uh is going to do really well as prices go up um there's even been uh some coverage i think from some of the research analysts that are like point shares benefits when eth goes the uh proof of stake right there's just kind of all kinds of different things being written or, or covered about the business how do you think about coin shares and like when when you think of okay this is a business we have today how do you describe it to people yeah um well, two ways to describe it, really. It's it's one, what do we do from a qualitative perspective? And two, you know, how do our earnings actually, you know, respond to different market conditions? Um, so if I had to describe it in a few words, it's an asset management business. Um, we currently have around 4 billion 
And we have it in a wide array of products now. Um, we have our legacy XBT provider products in Sweden, which are incredibly popular from the day they listed. Um, we have CoinShares Digital Securities, which is a, a platform um, of a different kind. It's a little bit more institutionally focused, a little bit more institutionally structured, a little bit cheaper uh, fee-wise. Uh, multiple products there and multiple listings on different exchanges you know for those multiple products we have a couple of um, private trading fund funds uh, run by uh, a chap that works for us called Lewis Fellas um, that do relatively sophisticated you know Bitcoin and ETH strategies for you know, high net worth and private and institutional investors we have an equities fund the block index that we joint ventured with Invesco we have CoinShares Fund 2 which is now four years old and is a 10 year duration private equity um, fund uh, closed that uh, run by Melton Demiras. Um, so, you know, a, a pretty wide spectrum of investment product. And, you know, you've know, you seen the news recently that we are involved with Valkyrie and we're hoping to also be a player in the, in the US ETF market now. So quite a wide, a wide different array. And it's, it's been really interesting to see how loyal certain customers are to certain geographies and certain structures. They know this ticker. And I'm like, well, that ticker's cheaper and it's the same exposure, but they don't really move. And, um, and our, our capital base is very, very sticky. And I'll tell you an interesting fact, which is of, our, of the assets that we currently have, I think we have given back way more than the invested capital that we ever received. In other words, everybody in our network en masse, in sum, is trading with house money. And I've never seen that before <laughs> in an investment product. Um, and the truth, you know, one of the one of the sort of unspoken truths about the uh, asset management business in crypto is you never really raise that much money. You kind of got to have money from three years ago that's multiplied significantly. And that's actually by far the best source of fresh AUM. I mean, the last month or two, I think our AUM has gone up by like $600 million. And that's purely, you know, I mean, there might be 10, 20, 50, 100 million, you know, here or there coming in or out. But basically, it's because the asset class is going up. So that's where we are actually synthetically quite long Bitcoin, because the more Bitcoin goes up, the more AUM goes up, the more our fees go up. <laughs> Very simple. And um, <clears throat> that's a good exposure to have. So that's that. The second part of the business, which has been, really evolving over time just changed changed so many times actually over the years is coin shares capital markets which is our market making business which was started back in 2015 probably 2014 because no one else would make markets in our securities because no one had the securities leg and the crypto leg simultaneously yeah, crypto guys and securities guys but nobody did both so we started that business um it's been through a number of cycles you know, broadly speaking, we make markets in our own products. Um, and as as conditions permit, you know, we'll make markets for third parties. Um, and we do an amount of arbitrage trading, whether it's, you know, buy on this exchange, sell on another one, buy a derivative that's underpriced versus another derivative that's overpriced. And, you know, no outright exposure or stuff like that. But, you know, these days we're probably doing between one and two billion a month. In the peak, we're probably doing five billion a month in that business. Um, it has represented over time anywhere from twenty-five to fifty percent of our overall revenue. So in some cases, almost matches the fee business that we have. And um, and what's happened, you know, despite the fact that volumes have gone down, the competitive landscape has shrunk by at least fifty percent, and so margins have gotten higher. And I don't think we're quite where we were, but it's not as bad as it sounds when you talk about a 50% drop in volume. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the money that can be made is, is actually um, more than, you know, it's, it's more than that. So, and that, that business, it sounds simple, but, you know, you have to set up all kinds of banking lines and exchange facilities and, and really be able to actually operate it, you know, manage the risk, measure the risk and, uh, and have the sort of liquidity and the partners around that you need to to make that work so you know that's that's quite a mature business at this point it's it's run quite professionally and, and it's a big contributor um the third part is as you say you know we have investments in probably 40 companies if you if you look at all of the pockets we have um some of those are actually side pockets some ex investors some pre-ipo investors 
that pretty much mirror the current cap table. Um, we have a fund with that group. We have a coin chest fund too. Um, we have um, you know some stuff on the balance, some significant stuff on the balance sheet as well. And um, and yeah, you know look, those are generally you know we've had a few losses like everybody else, uh, a few write offs like everybody else. But you know, dotted around there are some real winners. A, a great example was Block Demon. Uh, we had a position in Block Demon, you know, one of 25 positions in CoinShares Fund 2. And we managed to return all of the invested capital to the investors by selling a piece of that position um, when, you know, in 2021, which is obviously a, a wise thing to do in retrospect. So there's been some uh, good winners there. And, you know, more importantly than that, that's nice. But more importantly, we've done lots of business with our significant private equity position. So, you know, we do a lot of business with Kimenu, our custodian that we launched with Nomura and Ledger. We do a tremendous amount of business with Flowbank, in which we're a big, you know, client, um, a big a big shareholder. Um, we've done a lot of business with 3IQ uh, in Canada, you know, issuing uh, ETFs. Uh, with Kingdom Trust, um, uh, who have recently gone through a buyout uh, process, which was a, a good deal for us. So, and in all of those cases, you know, we were either clients of theirs or created and co-marketed products with them, or they became clients of ours. And um, and and that's been um that's been you know a good activity, not nearly as impactful as the trading and the investment management business. Um, but but we shall, you know, we're still in the game, you know, with a lot of those and see, see we'll see how they go. The final point I'll make, and this is a new one. So I would have said what I just said six months ago. The new one is is really in two pieces. There's money on the edge of crypto that is either crypto money. So, so just to throw out a couple of names, you know, the Binances, the Tethers, the you know, the, 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 the even DCGs, arguably of the world. And you know, these guys may, in some cases, not be deemed experienced enough to operate a regulated crypto business. Um, that's kind of a requirement in many, many cases now. And, you know, if you don't have the track record and you don't have the infrastructure or you've made missteps in the past, it's very hard to obtain those kind of licenses. We have a lot of licenses and, um, and you know, they've been hard, hard for three, four years to get some of them. And, um, and so we find ourselves in a position where we can actually form a buffer between capital and regulated businesses where those that capital cannot directly access. And we'll find ways, you know, to make that work, you know, within the appropriate regulatory framework. The second thing uh, that's going on is, you know, there is there is a, a cohort of asset managers who can't make it pay because, believe it or not, you know, and I've seen some examples of this, you know, you can have a few hundred million dollars in a crypto asset management business and still not be able to make it pay because of, you know, relatively low fees and relatively high regulatory costs and staffing costs. And so there's an opportunity for us. And, you know, I think the Valkyrie deal is probably in that in that flavor where, you know, we can bring our scale. Um, we can operate some of these businesses very little incrementally. And so there was a roll-up trade going on where, um, you know, the bigger managers can can take out the smaller managers and that can be on an outright purchase or on a buyout or on a JV basis. Um, so, and that's, that's a new activity, you know, and that, that to me is us finally getting paid for the gold-plated infrastructure that we spent so long and spent so much money on building. Now, on this part of, um, I'm going to call it, there's like the systematic stuff right where uh you either are passive in the market or you're not making decisions yourselves um mm -hmm. versus what I'll call maybe more of like the past uh in terms of understanding macro understanding markets uh making private investments yeah. how much of um crypto is different maybe than let's say in the traditional financial system where uh you know people yeah. see everyone from uh the citadels all the way to the 0.72s to, you know, even Dalio and um, um, uh, Bridgewater. Like a lot of these folks, I think, have really driven home this idea that like the machines are making the decisions. We don't mm -hmm. seem to see that much of it. Obviously, market making maybe is a little bit different than uh, some of the, the private investments. And maybe there's like the two extremes. But how do you think about like human intervention versus machine software, AI, and like this rise of the machines are smarter than the humans? 
something like something that's been a you know a growing trend throughout my entire career. Um, you know, when I started, it was 100% humans, and um, that is definitely not the case anymore. In the company that predated CoinShares, um, the commodity fund um, that uh, me and a couple of my partners ran, we actually ran both strategies. We had a purely quant strategy, and we had a purely discretionary strategy. And I ran the discretionary strategy, and one of my partners ran the quant strategy. And I have to say, I think they were very complementary. And, but the style could not be more different. Um, it's an entirely different activity. Um, so, you know, I don't think there's an, and even, even in the companies you just mentioned, the D Shores, the Citadels, the, uh, all these, you know, the, 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 the millenniums of the world, um, you will find actually, if you go below the surface, that both of those styles still exist. The difference and when it gets a little bit, let's say, uh, um, uh, what's the word? A camouflaged is in execution. You almost need an algorithm these days. Like in my day, you pick up the phone and say, you know, buy a thousand lots of crude oil, and then someone would scream onto the floor that you buy a thousand lots of crude oil. Nobody does that anymore. So, and the reason you need algos is that there are so many other algos that as soon as you put in an offer, someone's going to be ahead of your offer, going to be ahead of your offer, and they're going to they're going to gain you. So, so you shouldn't really be confused that the that in a way you might have a Stan Druckenmiller sitting there going, you know, I want to buy, you know, 100 million or 10 years, but he's not going to pick up the phone to the Chicago Merck and, and say those words. He's going to give that to Goldman or whomsoever, and they're going to run a smart algo that's going to do that. And that it's just a cat and mouse game. You know, there's no, I don't think there's any intellectual input into that. We run a ton of algos in CoinShares to do exactly that. You know, if we get lifted on a market making offer somehow, there'll be some algo running on, on how you're going to get that, you know, that position back again. Um, those algos are written by humans, by the way, not an AI, at least not yet. So, so in a way, you know, you're just really codifying what you would do if you were sitting there and you could do it that fast, which you can't. Um, but a lot of the, you know, our quants will sit around and they will write those algos, but the logic behind those algos, you know, would be no different to what a good discretionary trader would be doing and executing an order. So it's really, what's your strategy? Is, is it a discretionary strategy? There's a place for that. Is it a quant strategy? There's a place for that. But pretty much either way, you're executing with an algo. What are you most excited about thematically in crypto? So not like products, not CoinShare, um, you know, in terms of business lines, but are there certain themes or areas of the market that you feel like uh, are either under, you know, um, scrutinized at the moment and, and will be bigger than people think, or maybe even areas that everyone's talking about that you're less excited about and think could be overhyped? This episode is brought to you by Cal.com. What do I have in common with Chad Hurley from YouTube, Toby from Shopify, and Alexis from 776 and the co-founder of Reddit? We all use Cal.com instead of Calendly, and we are all early investors as well. Cal.com is leading the charge of scheduling platforms in the open source sphere, offering you the chance to harness the efficiency previously reserved for elite corporations and tech gurus. If you like to have your calendar organized and be able to have an efficient exchange when scheduling, but you love all of the benefits of open source technology, then Cal.com's for you. They are transforming sophisticated calendar management into an accessible tool for all via a user-friendly interface. You can customize it and you can make your calendar work for you. Use code POMP for $500 off when you set up your team with Cal.com today. Again, go to cal.com, C-A-L.com, and use code POMP to get $500 off when you sign up. Cal.com, an open source tool that allows you to take back control of your calendar, be efficient when scheduling, and make sure that no one can steal your time. I think the most interesting observation, POMP, has been, I never really understood how there was room for the proliferation of different crypto assets that occurred. You know. For quite some time, uh, I was active in crypto when there was only Bitcoin. And then I think there might have been uh, Litecoin. And then I think there might have been Ethereum. But it seemed like a long time to get to like three cryptos. And, and we somehow went from three to 20,000 in a very short period of time. And, and what, what I realized finally was crypto is, is you know, very, very, very low hurdle of entry 
very high hurdle of success. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been frustrating that, you know, I've been involved with the Tezos Foundation for some time now. Tezos is a great blockchain. It's a very secure, very sophisticated blockchain. It's one of, you know, in my view, probably the top five in terms of its its functionality. Um, but it is very, very tough to unseat Bitcoin as a store of value and Ethereum as a, as a, as a, as a utility at this point. And there are some other promising, you know, candidates for sure. But it just seems that, you know, the longer time goes on, the more the infrastructure built around the legacy, old legacy coins um, becomes more of a factor for their longer term survival. And that makes sense in a way, because as we know, improvement protocols are there so that the community can improve the, the the network on which they're working and if they're getting an idea for the near protocol or the avalanche protocol um why not you know if it's a good one bake it into you know into ethereum so what i think what i think i'm learning here is that i wasn't sure how this would all unwind but it does seem to me that you know there will be some sort of darwinian extinction of a large number of cryptos and unfortunately a lot of those cryptos are the ones that you know the the uninformed retail investors might have piled into in 2020 and 2021. Um, you know, some of them are shocking, you know, shocking in terms of performance in 95% declines and stuff like that. And I think a lot of those things are walking dead. You know, I think we may be now reverting to, you know, a, a very limited number of meaningful crypto networks. And, you know, I think we just need to sort of circle in around those and kind of forget about a lot of this other stuff. And that, you know, that kind of evolution doesn't happen in normal financial markets. In normal financial markets, things are built behind a wall to last very robustly, very inertly, very featureless. And they'll be there for 20 years, like my HSBC bank account is pretty much the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, that's not the way crypto works. And so we had to find another creation extinction mechanism. And I think that's what we've been seeing. So this may sound boring, but... I'm most excited about Bitcoin and Ethereum for those reasons. I, I think that uh majority of the market probably feels exactly the same way. Um, another question I have is you've been doing this for 10, 11 years now. Uh, when you first did it, you've told me a lot of your peers were kind of looked at you like, hey, Danny, you, you okay? <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, a decade later, uh, have they capitulated? What, what are some of your peers doing? What are they saying behind closed doors? I think what my... And I'm talking about my peers outside of, you know, my financial market peers, okay, not not my, you know, not my inside crypto uh, kind of peers, but but the, yeah, they're, they're a cycle or two behind me, you know, they'll get there when you know you come to realize that you know there's a particular kind of heartbeat to crypto um, that is more volatile than other asset classes, and you know just because you lost forty percent on your last purchase. Uh, and might have been ill-disciplined in how to deal with that potentially, um, you will learn. And, and you know, I felt like, you know, post-2021, there a lot of my kind of outside crypto network um, kind of gave up on it. It's like, oh, you know, that's done. You know, that's over. And now, all of a sudden, like, my doctor called me up and it's like talking to me about do I like Bitcoin or Ethereum and how do I, you know, get involved, you know, in this current marketplace and I want to hold my own keys so I don't have exchange risk. And so they're coming back now, no doubt about that. And it's always when my phone's ringing with those kind of people that, you know, you realize you're in a different cycle. And and I suffered the same thing. I mean, my first exposure to Bitcoin, I bought it at 100. It went to 1,000 over the course of a year and then it went to 80 and my reaction was well that was fun but it's over right it's over and then you learn so cycle number four or five you know you kind of figure it out and it might not be an investment you want to hold all the time but when it's good it's better than anything and and i think people you know are, are now uh, dusting themselves off from you know the 2021 debacle and, and getting back involved now you know, what they should have done is read my LinkedIn post from, you know, right after Sam was arrested, where I was like, this is the wrong price. Yeah, so another guy that sort of blew up the world. And, um, and, 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 and you know, it's like seven out, as they say on the craps table. Um, but, you know, this, this, this is coming back. And I, I just think this is going to be a feature of crypto forever. 
and 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 maybe one day we'll we'll reach a point where nobody is a naysayer nobody thinks it's worthless nobody says it's backed by nothing and therefore it's useless and it's you know just a hotbed of criminal activity once you do not hear that anymore we may well have reached the terminal price but those voices are still pretty loud and um and that what make that's what makes me you know uh, optimistic for the for the future now my last question is uh if we had talked five years ago maybe you definitely you know further back than that and somebody said to me, hey, you know, who is Danny? Most of the description of your career would have been in the traditional financial world, if not all of it. Yep. When your career is done, when you decide, hey, I've had enough, are you going to be known as a crypto investor or as a traditional markets investor? And well, do you see pros or cons of either one of those? Well, I'm going to I'm going to reveal something to you tonight, Pomp, and we'll see what you want to do with it. But um, so. In July of this year, I turned 60. And um, I'm, I feel like I'm very, you know, young in body and young in mind. But the math is the math, okay? <laughs> and I went on a, I went on a, uh, I want to say it's like when you renovate your house. Um, I went to a clinic for two weeks and I had every test known to man and every therapy known to man. I had a nagging shoulder injury for a long time. You know, I had... Um, all kinds of stuff done. I may or may not have had uh, a little bit of uh, face work done. We, we, we don't need to uh, publish that too much, but I just wanted to, I wanted to sort of go, okay, we're going to, we, this has been the family house we've been living in and, and we want to live in it for a little bit longer. So, uh, so that's what we're going to do. And one of the things on my list was something that um, I promised uh, Jean-Marie, our CEO, and my good friend, um, we made some promises to each other back in 2014. And one of them was if Bitcoin ever got to a thousand dollars, I would have a Bitcoin tattoo. And um and many years later, um, so that must have been uh, you know, nine years later, uh, I delivered on the promise. And part of part of the part of the thought process, because I'm not a tattoo guy, as you can imagine, but part of the thought process was I wanted a kind of a memorial to Bitcoin and what it's done for me. And but that wasn't enough. You know, when I thought it through, I thought that wasn't really enough. And and what I what I thought was, you know, this is something I want to do for what Bitcoin is going to do for me and for the world going forward. And that was a really conscious choice. Okay. Um, I'll show it to you if you want. Yes. <laughs> no way. <laughs> That is amazing. How long have you had that? I had it July 4th. Wow. July 4th. And I'm telling you something. I had to think long and hard whether the Bitcoin market would rally because I didn't want to fall into the same trap as Novo. <laughs> no, Novo and you are going to compare notes in uh, in five or six years to see who made the better yeah. tattoo choice. I think there's a long way to catch up, but uh, anyway. So, so to answer your question, and that is the answer to the question. I think Bitcoin's a magical thing. I will, I will never cease being fascinated with it. You know, I, I, I kid you not when I say, obviously, you know, I have a lot of my net worth tied up in the company. I have a lot of net worth tied in, you know, some illiquid investments. Hundred percent, well, ninety-five percent to do with crypto. Um. And I can never get it right. I can never like get liquidity at a good price in my stock to get me cash to buy Bitcoin because by the time Bitcoin's up, you know, it's it's a chicken and egg. But if, if at any point in time, you know, I, I do get meaningful liquidity for my rather large position in coin shares, um, I am seriously thinking about just becoming, you know, I'm doing, you know, the, the ultimate thing. You know, we know it's a store of value. We know it's a medium of exchange, but is it a unit of account? I want to make it a unit of account. I want to, and I know there are some people that already do that more the more the maxis than, than the normal guys, but I actually want to do that because I really do believe in it, and um, and that's as much as believing in Bitcoin as disbelieving fiat. But um, but I, I plan to do that ultimately. That's a fantastic answer. I did not expect that. So that may be one of the best answers we've ever had. <laughs> uh, Danny, wh where can we send people to find you on the internet or learn more about coin shares if, if they're intrigued by what you guys are building and want to learn more? Sure. Well, uh, you know, uh, DM at coinshares.com uh, or Danny L. Masters, all letters uh, on uh, Twitter.
Awesome. Well, Danny, thank you so much for doing this. You are a, uh, an mm -hmm. investing legend, and I think uh, you've been a pioneer in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies for a long time. So people are very excited to hear your thoughts on where we are in the market, and we'll definitely do this again in the future. Awesome, my friend. Keep well. I look forward to seeing you in the next time. Hopefully, hopefully, you have this discussion uh, at a big high price. <laughs>